Welcome to the 80th reading of my memoir, The Innocence of Guilt. A Special Book I occasionally dropped in at an anxiety self-help group held in the small mall opposite my house. Hugely disappointing as all it consisted of were relaxation exercises on the floor. Then the women all lit up cigarettes afterwards while they drank coffee. I didn't like inhaling the smoke in the confines of the small room and seriously considered not attending anymore. On Monday morning, I made my way over to the group, went through the boring exercises, drank a quick cup of coffee and decided to leave. I didn't feel any better than when I'd first walked in. Then my eyes caught sight of a book lying on the coffee table amongst the used coffee cups and dirty ashtrays. I picked it up and glanced briefly at the title. Hope and Help for Your Nerves by Dr. Claire Weeks. As I idly flipped through its pages, the lady in charge casually said, you can borrow it if you like. I didn't think anything in its pages would be radical enough to help me, but I didn't want to appear rude, so I took it. Once into the book, I couldn't put it down. The author described my symptoms perfectly. The thumping of the heart that makes you fear you're having a heart attack. The tight chest muscles that make breathing so painful the panic attacks with the adrenaline rush, which activates the instinctual fight or flight syndrome, the sweating, the nausea, the weakness, the trembling, the giddiness. She described the guilt, most of it imagined, and the depression. Lastly, she covered the ceaseless thinking, which like a needle stuck in the groove of a record, plays out as obsession, followed by the tight band of pain around the head that doesn't go away even with painkillers. My worst living nightmare, the affliction I still didn't have a name for, but would come to know through other research into my problem as obsessive compulsive disorder. Dr. Weeks didn't coin it as a specific disorder, when her book was first published in 1962, but by the time I read it, 16 years later, it would be identified and labelled OCD in its own right. She categorised it as a particularly distressing aspect of any nervous illness, quite often brought on by constant introspection of the kind I was totally familiar with. I was a master at introspection. More important, the book convinced me I wasn't going crazy and I could get better. I now know why the book resonated so powerfully with me. Dr. Weeks suffered from panic attacks throughout most of her adult life. In so many ways, she trod those paths before me and knew every unsuspecting hole and half-hidden rock that could trip one up along the way. God didn't appear angry that another book had become important to me as well as his book of all books. In fact, he whispered to me from the far reaches of his seeming absence. You see, I haven't forgotten you. I'm finding you a way out of your mess. It may sound to some people so anti-Christian to say this, but Maybe he stepped out of the way for a while so I could take a detour, one so much more suited to lessons I needed to learn. I deliberately chose to keep all this information to myself. Hope and help for your nerves offered itself as my opportunity to get well. Not doctors, although the words of a doctor would help, or hypnotherapists, or pastors, all well-intentioned but uninformed friends, not even my own husband. According to the book, 
I wasn't to dwell on the repetitive thoughts drawing me into a cycle of obsessive, meaningless behaviour, nor to fight them. Fighting used energy and drained you. Instead, Dr Weeks emphasised embracing the thoughts by floating through them to the other side. The recovery lay there, she claimed. Imagining the process gave me a vivid memory of those dark, scary, yet courageous walks along the cherry tree lane of my childhood, where I sang my heart out in hopes of reaching the farm in one piece. Would this new journey be as frightening? And would I find myself alive, still standing at the end of it? My biggest worry was that my thoughts were me and to not let them have any consequence meant I would turn my back on myself. How can I do that without losing myself? I learned that most people have what are termed as free-flowing thoughts. These thoughts pop in and out of their minds all day long, and only those worthy of attention get time spent on them. The rest disappear from consciousness. I also learned that people with OCD tend to get stuck on one particular thought, often connected to some form of guilt. And if they don't pay attention to it, a dreadful terror descends upon them. Sometimes, albeit wrongly, for their pain was no less painful than mine, I envied people with physical compulsions. They could repeat their rituals and be done with them, but mine were all in my head no end to them. I wish that I could flip a switch in my brain to turn off the power source. Sleep only postponed the agony. As soon as I awoke, before my feet hit the floor, they started up all over again. Still, I knew I had unknowingly brought this on by myself, listening to lies in my head and elsewhere, and it was now up to me to do something about it. I'd also been reading books on self-esteem from a biblical standpoint, so knew I did not love myself the way God loved me, yet the scriptures said I ought to. I started to practice the method Dr. Weeks recommended. I let the bad thoughts come and tried to let them linger without responding to the fear. Let them do their worst, as the instructions said. But the process proved extremely painful. Huge waves of guilt and condemnation overwhelmed me and chased me back into the false security of the OCD cycle of familiarity, anything to avoid what the thoughts told me. The obsessive rituals of repeated phrases I used to reassure myself were like a drug I knew I shouldn't do them, but they seemed in themselves the only way out from the pain. All I achieved, though, was to substitute one pain for another. My plan wasn't working. In desperation one afternoon, I shut myself in my bedroom and cried out to God. A desperate cry from my heart. I said I couldn't do it without him. He must come through for me. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to subscribe, like or comment on this reading and hopefully you will tune in to the next one. Bye for now.